Well, I want to first thank everyone for joining us on uh, DOI.gov uh, for our first ever Google Plus Hangout. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Mr. Adams' eighth grade uh, science class from Cleveland, Ohio. Guys, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're also uh, uh, honored to be joined by uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt, who is the director of the USGS and chief scientist, and also Secretary Ken Salazar. Uh, so for the next uh, probably 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to be answering questions uh, from the students related to science and interior. So, but before we get to that, I'd just like to offer up uh, uh, some brief intro remarks from the secretary and from Dr. McNutt. So Mr. Secretary, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. So, Mrs. Aziz and to uh, Mr. Adams and to all of the students there in the eighth grade in Cleveland, I just want to say hello to all of you. And I want to say that uh, on behalf of uh, President Barack Obama, it's our honor to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you about science and about the future. The president in the last few days uh, held an event at the White House where he celebrated uh, the scientific achievements of young people. And uh, he is a great believer in science. Uh, science uh, will drive everything that we do, not only here in America, but around the world. And so we're very excited about uh, having this opportunity to spend some time in a conversation with all of you. And Dr. Marsha McNutt, who is uh, one of the best known uh, scientists uh, around the world, who uh, knows more about science from Antarctica to the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic and Alaska is the head of what is probably the best earth science agency in the entire world, uh, the head of the United States Geological Survey, where we have approximately 10,000 scientists to do the work of science. So I'll turn it over to Marsha to make a few introductory remarks as well. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And um, my greetings as well to the eighth grade class of Mr. Adams. And thank you very much, Mrs. Aziz, for inviting us into your class and your school and into Ohio. I'm very pleased to bring greetings from the USGS and all of our scientists to you. Um, I was amazed uh, when I started looking at the contributions that the state of Ohio has made to science and to discovery. I was amazed to learn that, for example, Thomas Edison hailed from the great state of Ohio. And uh, New Jersey may try to claim credit for him, but actually he was from Ohio. And in fact, when it comes to uh, trying to do discovery um, and exploration, Ohio wins in terms of astronauts. Um, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, and Judith Resnick, uh, three of the most famous astronauts ever all came from the great state of Ohio. So to uh, Mr. Adams in your class of eighth graders, uh, you, you all have a, a great legacy to follow in terms of great scientists and great explorers. And I hope you all someday will consider the U.S. Geological Survey because uh, our goal is to never stop asking questions, never stop exploring, and never stop pushing the boundaries of discovery. So, over to you. Great. Thank you, Dr. McNutt, and thank you, uh, Secretary Salazar. Uh, Mr. Adams, I'll turn it over to you guys for your first question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And we really want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for thank this you opportunity, much. and who knows, maybe one of these students will turn out to be another great Ohio scientist. Yeah. This is William, please introduce yourself, just your first name, and then ask your question loud and clear. Hi, I'm William Brown. I'm William, and my first question is. Yeah. How 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 far did the um oil spill go? Okay, so the question was, uh, for those at home, uh, how far did the oil spill spread? Uh, referring to the uh, Gulf Coast spill um, from 2010. Um, so, who would like to take that one first? Uh, Leo, let me uh, start it and then I'll turn it over to Dr. McNutt. Uh, the oil spill was uh, one of the most uh, significant national crises that we have seen in the United States uh, throughout our entire history. And so, Dr. McNutt and I spent a huge amount of time 
uh, centrally commanding the effort of the United States along with uh, Admiral Thad Allen and my colleague Secretary Chuer at the, the Department of Energy. And we are doing this at the explicit direction of the President that we do everything and anything that we could to stop the oil from uh, continuing to pollute the Gulf and, uh, and spreading. And so Dr. McNutt's scientists uh, actually have been uh, given great recognition because they were the ones who helped us figure out a way of uh, stopping the well. And so, Marsha, you may want to talk just a little bit about uh, the Sammy Awards and uh, why it was that uh, the USGS was recognized and answer uh, Leo's question. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for that question. Uh, actually, during the height of the Gulf oil spill, hundreds of thousands of miles of the northern Gulf of Mexico were closed to fishing by the national uh, marine fisheries uh, because of concerns about oil pollution. And there was a concern at one point that the oil might get into something called the loop current and get spread um, down below Florida and actually into the Gulf Stream. Fortunately, we got the well capped and uh, the oil shut off before that happened. So it never did get out of the Gulf of Mexico. It was always contained to the Gulf of Mexico. Once we got it capped, the oil then um, disappeared quite quickly and was consumed by microbes in the Gulf of Mexico, oil-eating microbes that uh, were able to consume the oil quite quickly because there are natural seeps within the Gulf of Mexico that um, uh, support a microbial community that naturally uh, eats oil that um, uh, every other day of the year uh, leaks into the Gulf at much smaller amounts than had been leaking from the Macondo well. And uh, we were fortunate that uh, through intervention techniques, we were able to put a cap on the well. And it was actually one of our USGS scientists who figured out a method of using pressure measurements from the well to determine that that cap would hold and that we could leave the well shut in safely. And because of that, the Partnership for Public Service honored a USGS scientist with Federal Employee of the Year um, this past uh, October. And that was actually the first time that a Department of the Interior um, employee had ever received the top honor in the federal government. So we were actually quite um, pleased. And he was also the employee who determined that the total amount of oil released during the oil spill was 4.9 million barrels of oil. Great. So thank Maybe. you for that question. Um, that event was worrisome. Uh, if I could just, a follow-up question, William. If I visited the Gulf today, um, in any of the four states that surround the Gulf, what would be the likelihood as a typical tourist of running into any sign that that spill took, took place? I think, uh, Mr. Adams, I think that uh, today, and I've been down there many times, I was just in uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, uh, I think about four weeks ago. Uh, you don't see anything anymore. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, you can go out with uh, some of our other scientists, biologists in the Fish and Wildlife Service, and go to some places along the coast where there were still some remnants, of, of, a few remnants of oil. And so the cleanup is still continuing. But uh, for all practical purposes, from the point of view of uh, the tourists and visitors uh, to the entire Gulf of Mexico, you can't tell that there was ever an oil spill in the Gulf. Well, that's, that's good to hear. As I said, that was a worrisome situation, and we just didn't know how it was going to turn out. Glad it turned out for the best. All right, um, our next student is Javion. Introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Javion Richards. And Loud. the question is, how could I become part of the USGS? Could you hear that? Could you just repeat it? I think, I think Dr. McNutt heard it, but could you just repeat it one more time? How could I become part of the USGS? Great question. Go ahead, okay. Marcia. Great. Well, Javian, we would uh, love to have a bright young member of uh, Mr. Adams' science class as part of the USGS. There are many routes to become a member of our staff. 
Uh, one way that um, young people begin to become uh, members of the USGS is they start by becoming uh, student members of the USGS through programs like SCEP and other youth initiatives that the secretary has been a very strong proponent of. And uh, the secretary and the Obama administration have been uh, wonderful cheerleaders for getting young people into the federal government, and particularly into um, our science agencies by promoting uh, programs that get youth engaged into the federal government. And we have a number of programs that we'd love to tell you about that bring students in for summer jobs and um, other uh, programs um, that uh, have you uh, intern with our scientists and help us with our research programs and then um, through college programs and other programs that let you uh, help us with our research and then after you're done with school we hire you on so it's a great way to for us to get to know you and you get to know us and we see if it's a match. Davian, uh, just to add a few comments to Dr. McNutt's uh, answer, we have in uh, the Department of Interior 72,000 employees, about 72,000 employees. And so it's important uh, to note that 40% of them will retire between now and 2016. So about the year that you're graduating from high school, we're gonna have some 30 to 40,000 uh, people that we're looking for to come and work here. And so wildlife biologists, uh, you know, space scientists, uh, oceanographers, all kinds of really neat things. And uh, we're not the only ones. There's lots of others that are out there. And uh, we have a huge internship program. We will be hiring 12,000 young people this summer alone. So hopefully, you'll look at the Department of Interior as one of the places you want to work, uh, work at in the future. And I would just add, um, uh, if you're interested in uh, the, the summer jobs program, a lot of that information uh, is on a, a special website we set up specifically for youth, which is at www.youthgo.gov. And there's plenty of information on there uh, that you can check out. Thank you. Right. Okay. And we do have uh, jobs all over the country. You don't have to come to Washington, D.C., all over the country. Uh, loud and clear. Hello, my name is Michelle, and my question is, what was your main role on stopping the oil spill? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? What was your main role on stopping the oil spill? What was our main role in containing the oil spill? Okay. Was that right? Yes. Okay. Well, what was your name again? Michelle. Michelle? Michelle. Call me a little bit. Did you say Michelle? Michelle. 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 Michelle with a D. Okay. Michelle. Role. R O L E. Role. Yes. What is what was the role of the USGS? It's kind of a follow up to uh, the other question about the oil spill. What is the role of the USGS? Uh, why don't you go ahead, Marsha? Okay. Well, um, while the oil was uh, spilling into the Gulf. USGS worked hard with the Department of Energy in figuring out how we could uh, plug the well. And the issue basically was there was concern about whether the well could be plugged without it leaking underground. And so the purpose of having uh, scientists from the USGS who were experts in the geology of the Gulf and in um, uh, in, in drilling and other aspects like that was to try to understand under what conditions could the well be uh, capped safely without causing a bigger disaster than the one we had on hand. So we had experts from drilling, experts in Gulf geology, experts in reservoirs, and uh, we worked hand in hand with engineers from um, the Department of Energy to figure out a way 
to plug the well and stop the spill without causing any more harm than was already happening. And that's what we were able to do. I also led a team that was charged with estimating how much was leaking from the well, because that was important in terms of assessing the damages that were being caused by the spill and that we were successful in doing as well. So thank you, Tichelle, for your question. Just as a follow-up to that, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, the company itself uh, who owned the well, were they were taking actions to, to stop it too. What was it like working you know, with, with the company on something like this? Because everyone has an interest in it. Everybody has resources. How did you coordinate what everybody could do to uh, come up with the best approach? Uh, we worked very well with uh, BP in this because, um, after all, everyone had the same objective, and that was to stop the oil spill. And BP had a number of excellent scientists and engineers who worked very well with us. And the purpose, of course, of having uh, the federal team down there was to assure our leaders in Washington, people like Secretary Salazar and Secretary Chu, that the federal interests were also being looked after um, and that um, proper decisions were being made. But um, we were all united in our desire to make sure that we were taking the most expeditious and lowest risk route to stopping that oil spill. Okay. Let, me, let me just add to that. The, uh, the pre President Obama uh, saw this as a national crisis, and he wanted to make sure that the whole of government was doing everything that it could to stop the wealth from uh, from leaking. Uh, under the laws of the United States, it was the the responsibility of BP to stop the leak. Uh, but we frankly knew uh, very shortly after the incident occurred that uh, there was not the capability that BP had to quickly shut it off. We knew that within probably 48 to 72 hours. So we assembled a federal team at the highest levels and included probably half of the cabinet secretaries reporting in to the president and to the White House. And we oversaw the effort. You know, at one point I said we were putting our boot on the, on the neck of BP. Well, that was because we were making them accountable to live up to their responsibility of stopping the leak. And uh, the effort continues as we uh, are working still uh, to hold the companies accountable for the pollution that they caused and the damage that they caused to the environment from uh, from the from, from the Wakanda well explosion. Seems like a situation where everybody really has to work together. At the end of the day, that's how it worked. Uh, you know, I'd start out my day every day very early in the morning, essentially getting a download from all of the United States officials that were involved and BP uh, that set out what uh, had been accomplished the last 24 hours of what the plan was for the next 24 hours, working closely with uh, Admiral Fat Allen and, and the White House and drafting the orders that we were giving to, to BP. So it became, yes, uh, you know, as Marcia said, we were all aiming at the same thing, and that was uh, we needed to stop this uh, well from continuing to pollute the Gulf of Mexico, we need to do it as fast as we possibly could. All right, well, uh, next we have Nicole. And Nicole will post her question. Go ahead and uh, loud and clear. My name is Nicole Briggs, and my question is, what type of other tests that the USBS is doing to benefit the world and people of today and tomorrow and the future? Marcia? <laughs> oh, oh. A question, but an excellent question. She, oh, she, 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 could spend two hours, she could spend two hours answering that question, but it's a perfect question. Good question. Oh, Nicole, you ask the best and the hardest questions. Um, you're so right. We could spend forever. But let me, let me just quickly, um, let me just do a quick summary. Um, in general, the USGS has two primary missions. One is to ensure the sustainability of the primary resources that society needs 
to ensure our quality of life. And that is things like fresh, clean water and uh, sufficient energy and uh, minerals that fuel our society. Um, these are Earth's resources that we need now and for future generations. And we aren't uh, responsible for policies, but it's the science that we supply that help inform those decisions on management of resources and policies that will ensure now and into the future our quality of life. And then the other primary responsibility we have is for natural disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, landslides. We're responsible for the science that helps communities build resiliency to ensure that we are well prepared for whatever nature throws at us so that gradually over the years, people know what to do and communities are better built and better prepared so that we reduce loss of life and we reduce the economic consequences of natural disasters. And those are the two primary missions. And every year we try to do a better job of securing our quality of living and reducing our vulnerability to natural disasters. Wow, that's a big job. That's why we need clever young people like all of you. Uh, awesome, okay. Uh, next, Valencia has a question for you. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Loud and clear, Valencia. Hi, my name is Valencia, and I wanted to know how is it like being a part of the USCS? Dr. McNatt, question, Valencia. Let me just say, Valencia, to uh, introduce uh, the, the, the note here for, for Marsha. It's a very coveted position to be the director of the USGS because we you know, I, we chased Marsha McNutt all over the world until we got her because she's such a famous scientist that everybody wanted to have her. And uh, she decided to take this position because President Obama offered it to her and because the USGS was the only thing that would move her all the way across the country from Monterey, California to uh, Reston, Virginia and Washington, D.C. to run this organization. So I think she has a very good answer for your question. Dr. McNutt. Well, Valencia, let me, um, let me answer your question in a slightly different way. Let me tell you, you know, a, a lot of days I'm dealing with big issues like huge earthquakes in Japan or major resource challenges. But let me tell you about my favorite day as director of the USGS. And that day, was the day because USGS also has under its purview the Board of Geographic Names. So we're responsible for assigning names to geographic features. And because of that, sometimes we get to right a wrong. And one of the wrongs that we got to correct was a mountain in the Santa Monica Mountains in California that had been misnamed and deserved to be named after the first African-American settler to come into the Los Angeles area. And his name was John Ballard. And a bunch of people put together a petition to name this mountain after John Ballard, who was a freed slave from Kentucky, who in the late 1800s moved to the Los Angeles area and was the first homesteader to homestead this, this mountain. And um, he not only homesteaded the mountain, but he founded the, um, uh, a church there called the AME Church, which is the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which grew to be the largest church in the Los Angeles area and was so large that it was the church where Michael Jackson was buried. And when we had 
this ceremony to rename this mountain after John Ballard, they had a big article in the Los Angeles Times about renaming this mountain and rededicating it to John Ballard. And literally thousands of people showed up to rededicate this mountain, all of them descendants of John Ballard who didn't even know they were related to each other. And they all came out to find these long lost cousins and they all said, our children now must grow up to be important. They must grow up to be somebody because their great, great grandpappy was somebody. Awesome. And it was a fabulous day. It must have been. That's great. Great indeed. Yeah, really, that's wow. great. That's great. That was my favorite day. <laughs> a great day it was. Valencia, uh, let's make way for Del Monte. That brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> brought tears to my eyes, too. Yeah, she deserves it. Okay. Del Monte, your name, loud and clear, and then your question. My name is Del Monte, and my question is, did the tsunami in Japan have any effect on the U.S.? So just in case anybody uh, missed that, I think the question was, did the tsunami uh, uh, that was a result of the earthquake in Japan have any effect on the United States? Was that the question? Yes. Great. Uh, let me take a piece of that, and then Dr. McMahon, you uh, go much more into it. Uh, it did have an, an impact on us because we were obviously monitoring it, and uh, the uh, president, uh, along with uh, Secretary Chu and others, were involved in uh, dealing with uh, the consequences that it, the, the tsunami in Japan has had, huge implications on the economy worldwide, and also huge ramifications for our programs related to nuclear energy, which is so important to how we power our economy. Uh, and I know because uh, USGS is the uh, expert on uh, tsunamis and uh, natural disasters, and uh, we had USGS people who were involved in it as well. Marsha? Yes, well, the Secretary's already listed quite a few of the uh, consequences in terms of nuclear policy and uh, economics. In addition, uh, the tsunami waves themselves uh, were recorded and did damage uh, along um, the Pacific margin to um, places in California, in Alaska, in Guam, and other places that are under U.S. jurisdiction. So we did see impacts. We are also tracking a very large island of debris, which is making its way across the Pacific Ocean, which is the um, garbage, basically, um, which was washed out to sea after Sendai was, was uh, basically destroyed by this wall of water. And um, literally entire villages were washed out to sea and all of this destroyed um, uh, buildings and um, uh, cars and, and other um, uh, infrastructure of society was all um, uh, taken out to sea and is now making its way across the Pacific to Hawaii and eventually to the west coast of the US. So a number of people have gone out and done a beach cleaning survey so that all of the beaches in Hawaii and in the west coast of the U.S. will be pristine clean before this garbage arrives so that we will be able to track what the impact of this garbage is when it arrives because everyone expects that it will have a large impact when all of this trash arrives from the tsunami. Wow. Great question. Thank you. Michelle? Introduce yourself loud there and question. Hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, my name is Michelle. How does our use of natural resources and the pollution we emit affect the future of the earth. So the, the, the question was how how is I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? 
Loud and clear. How does our use of natural resources and the pollution we emit affect the future of the Earth? Michelle, Michelle, the human activity has impacts and it has consequences as well. And so much of what we are seeing today is that because of the carbon dioxide emissions that we currently make here in this country, uh, the CO2, we are seeing the planet warming up. And so right now, if uh, you go to the Arctic, uh, conditions are changing very rapidly in the Arctic, uh, the ice is melting. If you go to uh, one of our national par parks, uh, Glacier National Park in uh, the northern part of Montana, right on the Canadian border, the glaciers are disappearing and uh, we expect they may disappear completely within uh, six days to ten years from now. Uh, and we're seeing changes in terms of uh, how much water is available in different rivers and how our plants are growing in different places and a whole host of other things. So everything that we do uh, in our society at the end of the day has some impact uh, on the planet that we inhabit. And so one of the primary missions of the Department of Interior overall uh, and it includes certainly the U.S. Geological Survey, but it includes the National uh, Wildlife Service and the National Park Service and so many of our, our, our other agencies which I oversee, is to make sure that we conserve our planet uh, for people beyond us, for your generation and for your children and for your grandchildren. And so uh, how we take care of our planet and uh, minimize the impact that we have on our planet as we use our planet one of the high priorities uh, that we have. And let me have uh, Dr. McNutt, uh, Michelle, answer your question a little more. Yeah, Michelle, I, I love the way you asked the question because you didn't even uh, limit it to only um, the global warming aspect, but you broadened it to other things we're doing as well. Uh, the All the waste that we produce uh, simply by uh, not thinking in terms of um, how we purchase goods. I know that many states are now outlawing plastic bags or at least charging people for using bags rather than bringing um, their own bags to the grocery store and recycling. Uh, it used to be uh, centuries ago that people didn't have trash pickup at their doorsteps. So everyone would have to live in their own plot of ground with all the refuse they produced for their entire lives. And believe me, people thought twice before throwing anything away if you have to live with everything you produce. And now we think nothing of um, all the excess packaging that comes with the things we buy because we just throw it away and it disappears. Well, we have to worry about the fact that our landfills are being um, uh, overcrowded and that there's no more room in them anymore. So um, basically, I think all of us do have to worry about the fact that um, as a society of consumers, we are running out of space and we have to think about recycling a lot more and we have to worry about what we're putting into the atmosphere as well as what we're putting into the ground. So thank you for your question. And I think it's part of being an educated person to know where everything we consume goes. That was a great question. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. All right, Jason. Previous poll. Loud and clear. Good question. Hi, my name is Jason, and I wanted to know do you were to prevent extinction of animals or plants in the U.S. What was the question again? Do you work to prevent extinction of animals or plants in the U.S.? Ah, yes. A uh, good question. Um, we absolutely do work um, very closely with our sister agency, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, on um, because where, whereas many people are surprised to know that the USGS, which they think of as primarily earth science related, but we have many biologists in our organization as well, and we work um, hand in hand with the US Fish and Wildlife Service 
um, to prevent uh, extinction of species. Uh, for example, we're working very hard on species such as the polar bear, uh, the Pacific walrus, um, the Florida panther, and other species of concern because, um, after all, biodiversity is very important for all of us. Extinction is forever, and we want to uh, make sure that um, we preserve uh, all species uh, in the wild where they belong. Thank you for that question. We had, uh, let me just add to what Marcia said. Uh, Marcia is right, and uh, so we're very proud of the fact that we have been able to save species that are iconic species from uh, going into extinction. So like the grizzly bear, uh, the wolf in the Rocky Mountains and in the Great Lakes, uh, the spotted owl in the Northwest, a uh, whole host of species all over this country, today are either recovering or have already recovered in large part because we want to make sure that as many animals as possible are animals that uh, are, uh, are, you know, continue to inhabit our earth. So uh, it's a great part of the mission of this department and uh, something that we're all very proud of. Okay. Awesome. All right, Mr. Adams, I think we've got time for probably two more questions. Okay. Good. Once again, Paul. Okay. My other question is, what new technology does the U USGS is planning on making for other types of natural disasters? That's a very good question, Marsha. All yes. yours. Okay. Um, the uh, newest technology that we're working on that we're extremely proud of is uh, working on a, a system for earthquake early warning. And we're working in partnership with uh, universities uh, in order to um, make sure that the next time a major earthquake occurs on the, uh, particularly in California, which is going to be the prototype place where we're going to be rolling this out, uh, as soon as the earthquake starts, people will get an alert uh, that uh, an earthquake is coming their way so that they'll, uh, things that will happen will be things like um, gas mains will shut off, um, high speed trains will stop, elevators will uh, stop um, at floors and the doors will open so people won't be trapped. If someone's in an operating room, um, doctors will be alerted so they don't start cutting patients open right before an earthquake happens. All sorts of important um, things will happen so that um, people will know that an earthquake is going to happen before the shaking arrives. So we're really excited about that. Thank you for that great question. Uh, thank, you. Right, thank you. And finally, uh, Williams, something else is on Williams' mind. All right. So, what's the coolest thing about uh, volcanoes? <laughs> Marcia, you know more about volcanoes than probably any other person in this whole world. So that's a great question for you. Um, well, uh, thank you for that question, William. Um, volcanoes actually are um, uh, very interesting because uh, in the case of uh, volcanic eruptions, they are actually... Um, easier to anticipate than earthquakes because they typically start with uh, something called um, volcanic tremor which is a number of small earthquakes happening so we know when an, when a volcano is starting to wake up so they give us more warning than earthquakes do but one thing that um, we're concerned about with a lot of uh, volcanoes is that we have a number of large sleeping volcanoes in the United States. Um, Yellowstone, Long Valley in California that haven't produced large um, volcanic eruptions in a very long time, but we are counting them down and out forever. And if they were to wake up, they could cause large um, eruptions that could produce lots of smoke and ash that could blanket large parts of the country. And so um, we're maintaining networks on all of these volcanoes just so that we would know if they start to wake up. But as I say, if they did, they could produce very damaging eruptions. So um, volcanoes are a hazard 
that um, uh, are, is probably underappreciated in this country? Thank you for that question. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. McNutton. Um, we actually got one question that will be both relevant to uh, both the Secretary and you, Dr. McNutt, that I thought uh, uh, students across the country would really, would really like to hear from both of you. And this question was, back when you were in middle school, were you good at math and science, and what was your favorite subject? And Mr. Secretary, we'll go to, go to you first. Well, when I was in eighth grade, uh, the same way as you are in eighth grade now, I always had my, I was strong in math and I was strong in science. And so, frankly, when I graduated from high school, I thought that I would pursue a, a math and science uh, engineering type of uh, vocation. But then when I got to college, uh, what I ended up doing is uh, majoring in political science because I became very much more interested in history and in uh, the politics of the United States and of the world. And uh, so my life has uh, been a life that has taken me from playing basketball, both in high school and college, to being uh, the attorney general of my state of Colorado, uh, moving forward and becoming a United States senator, uh, sir, being elected and campaigning with Barack Obama in 2004 when he became uh, the uh, U.S. Senator for the state of Illinois, I became the U.S. Senator for Colorado. And then now in uh, 2000, uh, I guess we've been at this job since 2008, so uh, from that point forward, then uh, serving uh, as a member of uh, the President's Cabinet, where I'm seventh in line to the Presidency, but working with the President on all the issues that affect our entire world. So what I would say is this. I think that, uh, I think somebody said that Confucius had a saying that uh, if uh, you find a job that you love, you will never work another day in your life. Uh, so find a job that you love, and you'll never work another day in your life. So I see, I see uh, Mr. Adams and uh, Ms. Aziz with uh, doing the kind of work that they love. I saw his uh, reaction there as uh, Dr. McNutt described uh, the renaming of the mountain in, uh, in California. You saw the passion that he has for his job. And so for all of the young people uh, who are there in Cleveland and those watching us from around the country, I would say the following. One is uh, science uh, careers are exciting and they're interesting and you see a lot of them on display here at the U.S. Geological Survey and the Department of Interior. It's a great place to go. Some of you will find your passions in other areas, uh, but at the end of the day, try to find what you really love to do because uh, then, as Confucius said, you'll never work another day in your life. I agree. Great. Dr. McNutt? Okay, well, um, let me tell you my story as a um, strong warning for all of you. When I was in junior high, high school, and college, I only took math and science courses because I really didn't like writing term papers. And by taking only math and science courses, I could avoid writing term papers. And so what do I spend all my time doing now? Writing papers. Okay. Warning for all of you. Learn to write. You will spend a lot of your time doing it. Great. Mr. Adams, is there anything you'd like to add or a final note? I just want to say thank you very much uh, to all of you for this opportunity. It was a great opportunity for our students and for our school. And hopefully we'll have some more Ohio scientists from uh, this group. Yes. That's great. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Adams, and thank you, Mrs. Aziz, for taking the time. And thank you to the students in the back. Um, and those of you who are tuning in at home, yep, wave to the crowd. We've got a few hundred people watching, I think. Um, and if people were joining us late, they can check us out. Uh, at doi.gov. We'll have this, uh, this Google Plus Hangout up uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, but until then, thank you to the class, thank you to Dr. McNutt, and thank you to Secretary Salazar for taking the time today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.